Welcome. Today I am joined by Dr. Jeff Davis, who is the Welsh Rugby Union and the, the current British and Irish Lions tour doctor. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing very well and uh, thank you for uh, asking me to be on this podcast. I feel very privileged looking at the people who've uh, gone before and done this. No problem. Now, this, the Jeff's internet has been a bit intermittent, so if we if we swap locations, then uh, that is the reason for that. So, where are you speaking from today? Speaking from a place called Dinis Paris, which is uh, just outside Cardiff, between Cardiff and Barry Bados, uh, famous for Gavin and Stacey. Uh, but yeah, we're in Dinis Paris, which is, uh, as I say, it's a 10-minute train ride into Cardiff, semi-rural location, and I'm lucky enough to be sitting in my conservatory having a very relaxed day, apart from doing this podcast. <laughs> and so, like, for you then, like, where did you, have you grown up in that area then? Yeah, very much so. Uh, and I'll probably explain the reasons why I haven't travelled that far. Um, but yeah, I'm Cardiff born and Cardiff bred, really. Um, went to school in the middle of Cardiff. Um, very much into sport as a as a school child and as a, as a teenager and as an adult, mainly football and rugby. Uh, big supporter of Cardiff City, Cardiff rugby, was was football, was rugby. So very much. Um, into my sport um, and my longer term goal was to try and obviously get involved in that when I if and when I sort of uh, go into the field of medicine but um, going through school I, we went to a, a very non-academic school uh, so much so that it didn't really have a sixth form um, but this was in the middle of uh, Cardiff um, and I was just lucky enough to, to appear to be fairly bright really um, through no no extra work it just I could get through exams fairly easily and probably the other schools I probably wouldn't have stood out so much really but because of the generally low academic level in this school I appeared a bit of an unusual sort of person I guess um, and I had no desire to do medicine I just really wanted to do what was the hardest thing to do um, I didn't want to waste that uh, intelligence I guess and you know the school obviously never had anybody who'd done medicine so their careers advice so when I mentioned I was good at sciences and things was for me to be a laboratory technician and they thought well if you do that you'll have overachieved um so that was quite bizarre our career advice is someone who's keen on doing medicine um but yeah because medicine was that appeared to be the hardest thing to get into uh, that was one of the main reasons why i chose it yesterday um uh, and obviously the, the sort of dream and the goals about involving professional sport came further down the line uh, as i got into my sort of general practice career really um but for me, the biggest obstacle, obstacle was to try and get in to do medicine, really. Um, and coming from a school like that, that school didn't even have a sixth form um, because people didn't go to university from the school. Um, but as it happened, it was also being taken over by the Welsh medium, so the school was being phased out. So even if they had a sixth form, I wouldn't have been able to study there. So I transferred to Cantonium, which is a school in Fairwater in Cardiff, and did my A-levels there, and then... Uh, luckily went on to do medicine, having finally been offered a, a place at Cardiff, and I can probably explain the reasons why I didn't go elsewhere, if you want me to Please, please do on. so, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was... Foolishly persuaded the school at the time to apply to Oxford. It was probably against my better judgment. Gullible had no sort of academic people within the family. Um, so I applied to Oxford and it was only after I'd applied and passed the entrance exam that they realised I had to get a, um, a language to apply for Oxford. So I'd already applied, so I had to do a crash course with the headmaster, which sounds a bit bizarre, but I spent a lot of time in his office because he, he was a French teacher as well. And over the period of eight weeks, I had to get up to GCSE standard uh, for French, which was, I don't know how I did it really, I don't know how I managed to pass with a grade C in the old days. I did manage to get a French O level. I'd have probably been happier retrospectively if I hadn't got it and my application was cancelled. Um, but yeah, because of the way you had to apply in those days, you, you, if you were applying for Oxford, you had to put Oxford first, or they wouldn't look at you. Bristol, they would only look at you if you put them either first or second behind Oxford. So I applied Oxford, Southampton, Liverpool, and Cardiff. Um, 
time I had a bit of a sort of problem that I knew that was going to be the case if I were able to get into university, particularly to do medicine. Um, and, and unfortunately, clearly, at every probably application, they would have known about the standard, and quite rightly, they'd want to sort of see what the state of the standard was to influence their decisions as to whether they're going to take a, a gamble on you, really. And so the first four interviews were Oxford, Bristol, uh, Liverpool, so, uh, Southampton, Liverpool, and I bombed every single one. And nothing to do with knowledge. I just couldn't actually communicate. Uh, and obviously, medicine communication is a is a pretty important skill, really, as I'm sure you'd agree. Um, and the same in Cardiff. My interview was appalling, really, um, because of communication issues. But fortunately for me, they decided to take a punt on me, um, and, and they offered me a place, which uh, which meant. The, the training sort of school was literally about three miles from home, really, which hadn't been my desire. I wanted to explore the country, explore, you know, go even go as far as field as England. You know, that was uh, that would have been a nice, uh, interesting uh, time, but it wasn't to be really. So people thought, oh, you know, he just wanted to be in Cardiff, but it couldn't have been further from the truth. However, uh, going to the Welsh National School of Medicine, as it was then, um, I had to have speech therapy, uh, which didn't really help and in the end you, you learn to cope yourself or I learned to cope myself um, but going through med school was actually quite challenging you know you try and hide in groups and not not be um, not be spotted if you like as a, having a standard so you'd rather, rather say nothing than say anything um, but as time went on that got better and better and I think being in general practice where a lot of your consultations are one-to-one -one, um, I learned a lot from that and learned how to control things and to manage things more appropriately. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically I got into Cardiff, um, by, not by default, but that was my only option, really. So if Cardiff had thrown the towel in, I wouldn't have done medicine, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't have been to some, I've done some of the wonderful things I've done, particularly in... So, Jeff's just moved location because he's got a better reception in his... Uh, well, what, would you, what would you describe where you are now, Jeff? It's my log cabin. I call it a gymnasium. My wife calls it my bar. So uh, you can take your pick on that, really. Yeah, well, I I'll look forward to talking to you about some of the <coughs> shirts you've got there, because that's that looks some impressive names. But just going back to what you were saying then about university then. So um, the was the stammer being brought on because of the, the, the stress you're under at the university interviews? No, not at all. That was just my my everyday life. I mean, when you have a stammer, the tendency is is not to start, to avoid stammering, and to avoid stammering, you stop speaking. Um, which sounds a bit bizarre, but I used to try and hide as much as I could on ward rounds um, and say the bare minimum. Um, so academically, medicine wasn't a massive challenge for me. The biggest problem was overcoming the sort of speech side of things, really. Um, and even during med school, I didn't really fully achieve that, and it probably took me another 10 or 15 years to be in a position where I'm comfortable. Um, the stammer is still there and I've still got to be, you often notice with stammers, they they pick, they've got a big vocabulary, I've got a big vocabulary and I can substitute words at the last second. So even chatting to you now, there are some words I'm about to say and I'll change it because I don't think it'll come out right. Um, but as I mentioned, I think, I don't know whether it came out earlier on, but uh, being in general practice and I had no great, career aspirations. My aspiration was to actually qualify as a doctor. Uh, and for me, that was my going to be my big achievement. So general practice was going to be the thing for me. Um, and again, I also felt at that stage that general practice would be good because it's a one to one. And it was very helpful for me. And, you know, as time went on, you learn to communicate and um, everybody needs to have good communication skills, but particularly if you're a stammerer, I think. Um, and uh, general practice, yeah, it was it was very helpful. Um, I was the first person from my family to go to university, so didn't have any academic support. So you had to make a lot of these decisions yourself. And I was not au fait with the career options in medicine. And as I say, I just wanted to qualify, really. Um, and then having qualified, my my aspiration bar was set quite low. And that's not being derogatory to general practice, but um, I spent 16 years as a GP and I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a huge amount from it. Uh, and it's only when you leave general practice that you realise how many skills you had that you didn't appreciate. Um, so, yeah, so that was my, so my initial uh, sort of med school journey was was quite challenging in many respects, but played rugby for Cardiff Medicals RFC, um, who, you know, they're still going as, as a great team. And I was proud to be their president last year. Um, 
and you make a lot of friends through through that side of things and a lot of friends I'm still friends with now and keep in touch and have an en- annual sort of meds rugby dinner and things like that kept you going through some fairly challenging times um but yeah for me it was just a relief to get through med school really um and then I was just sort of happy then to try and get into general practice and that at the time when I was looking to get into general practice it was a very popular career option because it goes in in cycles so I did my GP training in uh Newport um which is 12 miles east of Cardiff um uh, and I did my sort of uh GP, uh, A&E, psychiatry, uh, paediatrics, et cetera, there. Uh, and I finished that in August, July the 31st, 1990. And then on August the 2nd, I started as a GP principal over in uh, Barry Vados, which I mentioned before is um, um, Barry, but uh, it's about five or six miles from where I am now. Um, and at that stage, they probably had about 100 applicants for one post. So you you didn't swan around to Australia and things like that in those days. If someone offered you a partnership, then you would take it. So I went from being a GP trainee on the Friday to being a principal on the Monday. Looking back, I mean, I think probably taking a couple of years out and doing bits and bobs, what people do now is probably the way forward. But in those days, nobody actually did that. That was frowned upon. Right. So and what was the difference then from, from what you're actually doing day to day at that point? I, I, the big difference, obviously, becoming a GP principal was you're involved in the running of the practice, which is a, as a registrar, as it is now, or as a trainee, as it was then. You're basically seeing patients and, you know, doing log books of what you're seeing, et cetera, et cetera, so you can demonstrate your learnings. And obviously, during that time, you do your membership exam of the general, well, called general practitioners. I did a diploma in obstetrics and gynecology, which fortunately, I don't use that skill now. Um, but yeah, so I think basically, I mean, I think for me, you just get into general practice and then you decide, then I was deciding on to how to sort of set my career about not necessarily jumping into sort of sports medicine because there was no sports medicine. Um, but my longer term goal, and it sounds cheesy, but it was true, was to be the Welsh rugby team doctor. Um, and I knew that could take a long time to to come to fruition um, because once you had that job, very few people, you know, they'd have to be almost uh, carried out in a box really so it wasn't that people stayed there for two years and then somebody else took over you normally there for the long haul because certainly from my experience it's such an such an enjoyable and rewarding role um so my initial plans as a young family was just to get set up in general practice and that's what i did for my first nine or ten years really is just sort of get familiar with that job develop your communication skills learn to sort of cope with the stammer better um and all of those things happened really and then you're then thinking about the longer term i mean i think to to carry on doing that full time for 35 40 years takes some doing and that certainly wasn't for me um i was looking for something a little bit more not challenging but more aligned to my interests i guess um and that's why then i did uh diploma at Bath University, at Bath Sports and Exercise Medicine, and then went on to do an MSc, um, just setting in place some of the uh, foundations, really, for hopefully moving further down the line. And I'll chat in a little bit about sports medicine becoming a speciality in 2007 and how that changed my my sort of thoughts on general practice. But for me, initially, we were trying to get a postgraduate qualification. And when the family were a little bit more sorted, then trying to do a bit of work in sport, and I initially um, did some work with Cardiff City uh, as the initially crowd doctor. So you need to go on a crowd doctor course. And I looked after some of the reserves uh, teams. Um, there was a first team doctor who obviously ran the show and he was the sort of prime person there. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. Um, I changed from there because I think uh, the incumbent doctor felt a tiny bit threatened by my presence. And I think at the end of the second season suggested I moved down the road to Newport County um so that's really what pushed me into rugby then rugby medicine and that always been my first look because i played rugby until the age of maybe 30 um played a lot of football in school but rugby was my first love um so i then contacted cardiff rugby and the then, then doctor or head doctor roger evans who's also involved with the welsh setup was a, a very well-known a e consultant and famous raconteur brilliant storyteller but he welcomed me with open arms. And in those days, these were voluntary roles. And Cardiff Rugby used to have on the steps by the 
tunnel. There'd be about six or seven people standing there, and people would probably wonder who these guys were. And it was all the medical cover, really. It wasn't a structured thing, but there would be uh, two or three orthopedic surgeons, myself, an a &E consultant, and Max Fax consultant. And there was no structure as if there was a big injury, who goes on? It was almost we would push somebody or they would push you and you'd go on. It was a long way from the days where we are now and it's so structured and everybody's up to speed with their five, six courses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I did that for a few years and then I sort of took over the sort of lead role at Cardiff and decided to do some work during the week. This was completely voluntary at this stage because money was quite sort of scarce uh, and it still is within Welsh rugby, I think. Um, but I think you had to be prepared in those days to do a lot of voluntary work. And it was only after doing that and justifying my role that they did actually start paying me for my session during the week. Um, but it was pretty tough putting a lot of effort in and getting very little financial reward. Um, and alongside that, then I also did the Welsh under 18s rugby uh, for probably eight years. Um, the under-20 slot was taken by Gareth Jones, a very good sports physician locally. Um, and John Williams was obviously the well senior doctor at that stage. So my only route in to get my foot in the door was with the under-18s, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And, you know, you sort of, in my early stages, saw the likes of George North and Dan Bigger, Lee Halfpenny coming through. And it was great then to sort of work with them further along in their career and in my career. Um, but it's pretty tough because there's a lot of Sunday morning trainings and when you went away on tournaments, you might have to sort of go into a hostel and share three or four of you in the same room, um, a long way from the sort of five-star hotels that you tend to get at the higher end of the international spectrum these days. Um, but it was just very good for me to, to get my foot into the Welsh Rugby Union door, but also to do a bit of international rugby, albeit at a very sort of relatively junior, junior age. But again, these were all stepping stones for me to get in that ultimate role really further down the line. Mm. And so for all of these things then, is that, not that it would be easy because there's obviously a lot of different things that you went through, but how competitive was it when you were going for these various different roles? To be quite honest, it wasn't very competitive. There's no interview process as such. I think they were just happy for someone to do the job. Um, I mean, Cardiff Rugby, they, if I didn't apply, they'd have carried on you know, with the, the way they were doing it. But I think as the game became more professional, you, you had to potentially further down the line, get your sports positions involved. And that comes down to specialty recognition, et cetera, which I'll come on to in a little in a little while. But there was no interview process, really. Um, again, for the under 18s, there was I was probably the only person who was prepared to do it, really, because it's not the most glamorous of roles. But I could for, for me, I could just see the bigger picture, really. I think if you can. You can work within in, a, in an organisation, albeit at a relatively low level. The fact that you're there, you're doing it, you're not being rewarded very well for it, but you're gaining experience, you're mixing with people involved with, with the Welsh Rugby Union, and I think it just ends up getting your face known, really. And I think I was prepared to do that for the ultimate aim of getting the, a bigger reward, perhaps quite a long way down the line. And it was a fairly long way down the line, I have to say, but... Again, I think, you know, um, some people, obviously, some sports positions have a lot of, you know, um, a lot of jobs move around. Phil Batty, I was amazed. I'd forgotten how many jobs he'd had, really. But it's fascinating, you know, uh, Man United, Blackburn. I actually did a clinical attachment at Blackburn with him uh, when I was doing my diploma in Bath and uh, spent a, a week there with him, which was very, very enjoyable. And I learned quite a lot there. Um but, you know, obviously Man City and then England rugby. And whereas for me, I, I had a, a fairly simple goal, really. And when I did get that role, I was happy with it. You know, and I'm, I, I am ambitious, but once you get a job that you that you enjoy and you're satisfied with, then I'm happy to sort of carry on in that role. But it took a lot of work to get to that position. And I'll discuss that as we go through now, really. So we uh, because the big thing was sports medicine became a speciality, and, and Phil Batty alluded to this, uh, in, I think it was 2007. And obviously the Olympics were coming to the UK, um, so they were keen to up the sports medicine side of things. So in 2004, I went down to half-time general practice to do more in terms of MSK and sports medicine, because um, I knew that this speciality was coming along. Um, and I knew I had to do a lot more than just being a GP. 
to ever potentially get onto that specialist register. So I went down to half time and uh, I'd set up a musculoskeletal treatment team on the NHS for Cardiff and Vale Trust, which was like an orthopedic triad system, which you know happens to, to this day in many places. And unfortunately, I mean, it was good. It was, we looked at spines, knees and um, foot and ankle. Um, and we did a had a very positive impact on orthopedic waiting lists and it was very successful and I was involved for about seven or eight years only leaving in the end when I became a, a specialist that, that they wouldn't give me a consultant contract so they forced my arm really I was just being paid as a contractor which you know wasn't of any great value to me in the longer term so I left that role in as part of the musculoskeletal treatment team but during that time I'd also started working down in Tidworth for the military I had no military links whatsoever but I knew the military had a very good rehabilitation setup. At that stage, they had Headley Court and then about nine or 10 regional rehabilitation units, which uh, were very much set up to rehabilitate injuries within troops, whether it be Army, Navy. Um, and they had very good rehabilitation. You had rehabilitation instructors, you had very good physiotherapists, access to ultrasound, access to fast track surgery. Um, so I spent about 10 years in Tidworth. Um, it was a bit of a ball ache really in terms of travel and being away from the family because I usually, I think I used to work there on a, a Wednesday and a Thursday. So on a Tuesday night, I would travel down to Tidworth. Um, funds were a bit tight at that stage. So I'd stay in a travel lodge, uh, usually for about 19 quid. So uh, my wife was happy I wasn't spending too much of, uh, of our money. So I usually stay there for two nights and then travel back on the Thursday afternoon. But the great thing that I was able to do when I was down there was because I had a lot of dead time. I could then use this towards putting together my portfolio uh, to get on the specialist register. So as I say, it was uh, recognised as a specialty in 2007. So I then spent probably two or three years putting together my portfolio, um, which was very onerous. And I think I think I had three box files full of documents. This was in the days when it was all handwritten and paper. I do actually assess CSER applications, which are specialist recognition applications now, and it's all computerized. Um, but this was the old days when it was paper and it was a very onerous task. But I had this time, I had this sort of time to kill in effect down in Tidworth, and I used that to my advantage during those times. Um, I also did some work in uh, the re rehab unit in St. Athen, which was very interesting because you also looked after some of the, the special forces guys from Hereford. But the Maya clinics, which are multi-injury assessment clinics, um, in Headley Court, you have about five or six people involved in a, in a consultation. Myself, uh, in, in the smaller unit, it's usually yourself and, and a very skilled physiotherapist. Um, and I work with a guy called Alan Colvine, who um, I believe still works in, in RU Tidworth, um, but he was a fantastic physiotherapist. And I would encourage all budding sports physicians to spend time with physiotherapists because doctors don't often know how to handle or to hold patients. They're very much standoffish when it standoffish when it comes to clinical assessment. And Alan taught me how to examine so many joints in such a proficient way. I'd like to think he probably learned one or two things off me during those ten years. But you know, learning how to hold a leg when you're assessing somebody's MCL, for example, you watch a physio do it and then you start doing it yourself and you, you suddenly realize how much skill they've got and as i say that was very in, invaluable the other big thing that i got from the my clinics was having the uh, the diagnostic ultrasound on site as in there was a machine uh initially obviously i was very very raw but i always tell people especially sports physicians you, you have to get msk ultrasound on board as a skill as soon as you can because it's such a long learning process uh, and I came into it fairly late um, due to obviously circumstances but um, it's such an essential skill to have but you need to access to a machine to be able to do that and initially I didn't have any formal training to begin with um, but I would a lot of our guys would go for MRI scans so if we're sending something for an MRI of the shoulder I would scan I would ultrasound scan them myself and I'd write to the back of the notes as to what I think was going on and then you compare that with the the images and the results of the MRI scan, and that was a good uh, initial learning uh, for MSK ultrasound. I was also lucky to have support from a radiologist in Cardiff, Dr. Kath Lyons, who's a very skilled MSK radiologist, and I would sit in on many of her NHS clinics. 
um, and found that very invaluable. And then I did the PG cert in Bournemouth. Again, a very, very good course where you can obviously do PG cert, diploma or MSc in, in MSK ultrasound. I found that very useful. And then I went back to Cath Lions further down the line with regard to developing skills uh, with ultrasound guided injections. And I know there are some good courses around now, but in those days, these courses were limited. And I remember going into one of the private clinics with Cath on a Saturday afternoon. I think she gave me a, uh, a chicken leg and an avocado and just sent me off to play with that with the needles to work out how to sort of place your needles and how to, and you know, it was great for her to give up her time, but obviously it was very labour intensive for me. But having developed those skills, so useful in the private sector, but very, very important when you're travelling with teams. So, you know, going with Wales or with the Lions, you know, you always have an ultrasound machine with you and you're able then, therefore, to be fairly self-sufficient in terms of point of care ultrasound, guiding injections, et cetera, et cetera. So, there's one advice I always give to budding aspiring sports physicians is to to get MSK ultrasound on your list as soon as you can and just develop it because you'll always learn. You'll you, you'll never be finished in terms of knowing what MSK ultrasound can give you, um, but you've got to be using it on a regular basis. And I know there's a lot of uh, courses and courses that provide machines these days, so the landscape has changed much significantly and it's much more favorable to getting on board but when i was doing it it was very difficult to get any training um but it is so important it's like the stethoscope to a cardiologist i think um and i could do without the stethoscope i mean mine's covered in cobwebs really but my ultrasound machine is uh is used quite a lot really so then for i suppose a couple of questions so around that ultrasound bit then so was that what point did that start to become something that was really prominent within sports medicine? Well, I think it's it's, it's fairly recent, really. Um, probably in the last um, 10, 15 years. I think there was always a reticence, I felt, from radiologists to allow um, non-radiologists to use ultrasound. Um, probably a lot of old school radiologists. And I think that was the, the big stumbling block initially. But then a lot of Radio radiographers were trained in using ultrasound and I think a lot of the probably the younger um, radiologists you know they, they were not threatened by our or by people sort of taking a little bit of their skill but I think again it's um, so it's quite difficult initially but I think it's become much more uh, accepted now they don't have to be a, a consultant radiologist to provide an ultrasound scan um, having said that the most important thing is you stay within your scope of practice and your expertise I get asked sometimes to do ultrasound scans or ultrasound in scan injections on certain bits of the body, and I'm not happy doing it. I've not done them, or I'm not, I'm not happy with it. So you've still got to know your limitations because you're not a consultant radiologist. Um, but the skill, the, but the the benefits it's brought to me have been huge. But it is important not to get carried away, and I still send people to Cath Lions for an ultrasound because I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a an expert in ultrasound. I've got decent proficiency in it for certain types of injuries and certain types of pathologies um, but I certainly wouldn't be giving um, a diagnostic report on somebody I'm not involved with so for me it's you take a good history you do a clinical assessment and then your ultrasound is the icing on the cake really obviously as, as a radiologist you're actually just ultrasound and you're not getting involved with any clinical decision making in general terms you just provided a report whereas as a sports physician that uh, scan is hopefully just reinforcing what you probably know from your history and from your clinical assessment. Yeah. Yeah. And then so go, going back to you in that profession then within the, the sports medicine, like, what point did that have, um, did the, was that help pivotal in you getting the roles that you were getting? Uh, yeah, I think, it was, I think having that skill did set you out uh, above some other people who didn't have that skill. Um, but for me, the the big um, the big career change was in so I went to part time in two thousand and two, and in two thousand and four, once they'd announced that sports medicine was going to become a speciality, I left general practice completely, um, which a lot of people thought was a very foolish decision um, for all sorts of reasons. But my um, thoughts at that time, and my wife thought I was a little bit mad, um, she probably was right. Um, was that if I 
if I left general practice but still did locums, that for me would take away the hunger that I needed to get on the specialist register. So I thought if I made things difficult for myself in the short to medium term, I'd benefit in the longer term. Um, and that's exactly what happened, really. So I vowed not to do a general practice session from the moment I left general practice, and I haven't done. Um, so I had to make money elsewhere. Um, so I had nothing to fall back on because I mean, I probably could have done some locums, but I'd said and I made a big song and dance that I wasn't going to do any more general practice. So I couldn't go back on my word, really. There were times when I wish I hadn't said that. Um, but it just made you go out and, and you know, chase work. And, you know, some of that work was was good. Um, I worked in Cooper MSK in Bristol for maybe 10 years. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. Um, I did work in the Bupa Centre in the Barbican in London. Um, that was one of my poorer decisions, not because it was uh, a bad job, but it happened to, uh, it was in 2007, 2008, when the big recession hit. And I would be going into London on a Monday morning and seeing two patients. Um, and London's a long way from Cardiff, as uh, as I'm sure you know. Um, so, yeah, so, but I was happy to put myself out there and to try and obviously try and uh, make money for the family, um, but also just develop that career, really. So um, I worked, obviously, privately in Spire and in Nuffield and in St. Joseph's in Newport. Um, I mentioned Ariath Sinathan as well. So certainly sports medicine in, in, you know, 15 years ago, it was a matter of developing little bits of jobs. And it is the same, really, to a certain extent now. Um, very few people are in one role as a full time position. So you've got to often have a portfolio career. Um, but it was stepping back from general practice completely was a big incentive to me. Um, and the other thing then that came along a little bit after that was because of the Olympics, the London Deanery were advertising training positions in sports medicine training. I don't know why I, I applied for a three year full time role in London Deanery probably just to see whether if I could get the job, because I probably wasn't going to uproot everything from Cardiff and go and work there. But I went for interview, was offered a three year training post, but it would mean I'd have to ditch everything else that I'd set up locally. Um, so I politely said, well, I can't really sort of uh, do that. But then fair play, they 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 offered me, they said, well, we'll, we'll offer you um, what was it? Uh, a 12 month training, uh, part time training post in any specialty you want and we'll fund it locally. I thought, well, that's all right. That's quite nice, isn't it? So um, public health was the one that I felt I needed because just being a GP is not public health. So I felt that was one that when I put my specialty uh, application in, that public health was one that looked a bit weak. So I spent six months as an SPR in sports medicine working uh, in, in Merthyr in their public health department, funded by the London Deanery, which is a little bit ironic, really. But um, there was a lot of money available to train sports physicians. So I sort of put, took that to my advantage, really. Um, and as I say, I then spent three years putting together my application. Because I always had a vision that when the Welsh rugby job was advertised, they may well be asking for somebody on the specialist register. Um, so I had to get on it. You know, there was there was no two bits about it, really. So, um, so I did it. I got on the specialist register in 2011, which is, I think, four or five years after it was sort of announced a speciality and at that stage there were there were two uh, sports uh, consultants in Wales and I think probably less than 100 in the UK um, and then in 2012 the Welsh job was advertised and it was asking for a, a specialist in sports medicine now whether that's because they knew I, I was on the specialist register or not I don't know but there were a lot of applicants but it was narrowed down to three who were on the specialist register and um, three well two very good candidates and myself um but i was lucky enough after going through a pretty rigorous interview process to be offered that role um in 2012 which obviously i've been there for 12 years now so uh suggests i'm fairly happy in that role um and yeah i mean i can tell you a, quite a bit about that role shortly but um it's that was my career aspiration really and uh still enjoy it to this day and i've just signed another four-year contract so I must be enjoying it and they must be enjoying me, I hope. Yeah, no, congratulations on that. So, and then what was it like? Well, two questions here. So what was it like when you got the role of being your dream job for, for an entire time and also like going through that process? And you say it was rigorous. What what, what did the, the interview involve? Um, yeah, it was it was rigorous. So basically the, the outgoing doctor was there. The 
WIU chief executive, Rob Howley, was there. And I think somebody from HR. Um, it was in the stadium in one of the boxes, so you could see the pitch in the background. Um, uh, but you had to do a presentation. I can't remember on what. You were given that in advance. You had to do a presentation. And then it was probably about a two-hour interview. Um, and again, as Rob Howley jokes with me afterwards, he said, I interviewed terribly. And again, I think my stammer came back to bite me on the bum a little bit um, because it was a job that I wanted. And, you know, there was a lot of stake for me. Um, so I didn't interview very well. I knew that. And Rob Howley keeps reminding me. So clearly I didn't interview fantastically well. But I think they'd seen enough of me probably working with the age grades and, you know, word of mouth working at Cardiff with the likes of Martin Williams, Gethin Jenkins. Um, you know, I think that people have probably felt that you know, he can clearly do this role. Um, so I was, yeah, and what was not bizarre, but sort of after the interview, I was doing a clinic in uh, an MTT clinic in for the NHS uh, in uh, Barry Hospital. And I get a phone call from Roger Lewis, the chief executive. And I thought, this is it now. And he rang me up and it was about five o'clock. And he said, uh, oh, you know, we're, 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 um, we're, we're impressed with everything. He said, but... Uh, but would you be uh, up for another interview tomorrow morning? And I thought, oh. So I was hoping to find out that that day whether I got it, and and I didn't find out. Um, so I had to sleep on the fact that he was going to ring me the following morning. And again, I was in the MTT clinic, so I was waiting in the car park of Barry Hospital for a phone call from from uh, Roger Lewis, and he rang me and just chatted about a few minor things, and then offered me the job. Right. Oh, so you didn't have to do the second interview? No, that was just. A, I I was assuming it was going to be something detailed, or they were going to call me in. But it was it was like a five minute chat on the phone, really. So I'd been sweating all night, probably slept for two hours, and it was just basically ringing me to tell me I got the job, essentially. So uh, <laughs> that was quite a surprise, really, and a bit of a shock. Um, but yeah, that was, so it just made everything worthwhile. You know, the career, leaving general practice, which you know, as Phil Batty mentioned, you know, is such a secure position. You know, it's got a very good pension and, you know, but these things were, were a long way from my mind in my decision making, which probably meant I wasn't really thinking straight because I just had this one goal um, and uh, I, I wouldn't listen to common sense. I just had to do what I had to do. And luckily, in the end, it worked out. I mean, I think uh, I'd have had a fair bit of egg on my face if I hadn't got that job. And I don't know where I'd have gone from there, to be honest. Um, so I had pushed most of my eggs into one basket. Um, and I was very patient. And obviously, when it came along, I was lucky enough to be uh, to be offered that role. And I've had a great time in the last 12 years and met some fantastic people, had some great successes some you know, great highs, great lows, but toured the world. Um, and just, you know, I've had a great time, really. So, yeah. And what what are the, some of the particular things that do stand out for you then in your role? Now? Well, I remember uh, starting in. Basically, the outgoing doctor, John Williams, uh, I think, well, I was offered the job in May, but he clearly wasn't going to give up a three match tour to Australia in the June. Um, so he uh, so I was starting the role in the autumn. So he had a lovely three, I don't know, four or five weeks in Australia. Um, uh, I actually went on tour with Cardiff Rugby to Bloemfontein. Um, uh, during that time anyway, but um, that wasn't as glamorous, I have to say, although we did win that game against the Cheetahs. Um, but I started in the November and we played four um, this four autumn games. Um, and bear in mind, Wales had come off a fairly successful period with a few grand slams. So the new doctor turns up, we play four games, we lose four games, and we have some cat some big injuries during that time. So the busiest autumn I've ever had, I think. Um, and as I say, we'd played four and we'd lost four. So it wasn't really looking very good. Um, Six Nations start, we play Ireland at home. Um, half time, it's something like, I don't remember the exact, something like 27 3 to Ireland. Um, so clearly, the common denominator has to be me, really. Um, other people were thinking that, and I was beginning to think it as well. But we came back fairly well against Ireland, but we lost. Um, but then we went on then to win the next three games and then we had a a title decider, which you may have remembered. And a lot of uh, all Welsh fans will remember it and probably a lot of English fans will try and put it out of their, their minds. But it was a Friday night game in Cardiff um, and England were coming for the Grand Slam. 
Um, and we had to beat England to win the championship. And it was just one of those days where, and they don't happen very often, um, but just everything was right. You know, the atmosphere was right. Everything was done right. And I think we won 27-3 or something like that. Um, a bit fortuitous, possibly. And I think, you know, we were very lucky in the early stages that some of the sort of uh, 50-50s went our way. But, you know, to, to win that, and obviously to, to win that uh, championship in 2013 was was quite special and I'd been in the job less than a year really, and it didn't look like I was going to last very long because of our um our, our defeat ratio in the first five games um so that that was a pretty high point um and I, I've toured to you know I've been to Japan twice I've been to New Zealand several times South Africa several times Argentina America um so it's been great and uh, you know I've got four or five very high points um there's obviously lots of low points and I dare say there'll be a few more of those on the radar over the next few years as we rebuild uh, with a very young squad just being named for the uh, for the Six Nations coming up. But um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've obviously won. We did win a Grand Slam in 19 and a championship in 21. Uh, again, I don't want to upset the English listeners, but one of the high points. And again, Phil Bathy mentioned that he left the England job before the World Cup in 2015, because he had a sixth sense that things weren't going to go well. And he probably didn't think it'd be as bad as it was, but being knocked out by Wales um, at Twickenham, um, I can see why he left before that, really, because uh, for us, that was one of my high points, really, because we were very much the underdogs and England were the better side on that day and they should have won that game. Um, we were very lucky. We were we were battered and bruised. We had... Um, a scrum half on the wing. We'd lost about four or five players with big injuries, uh, but England England didn't put us away. And you know, in the end, we scored. Gareth Davis scored that try. Dan Bigger took a, a, a penalty to win the game. And you know, against all the odds, and I guess as I say, we weren't the better side that day. But at the end of the day, it comes down to winning, really. And um, we were then able to watch the I think England Australia game. We were in one of the local hostelries watching it. Um, myself and Prav Mathema. And a few others uh, having a nice meal in England, Australia. No pressure for us because we were through. And I think Australia won. And obviously, England were knocked out of their own tournament, really. So the margins are so fine at this level. Um, and I've seen that many times where we've possibly should have won and lost and vice versa. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to make your own memories and enjoy them. And what you know you will remember, somebody else will want to forget and vice versa. You know, there are many times where I want to forget things. And yet, you know, one of the other doctors will be sort of celebrating in in their own success, really. So it is a very bumpy ride. You know, it is a lot of ups and downs. But I've done three World Cups, Japan, England and France. And they're just great tournaments where you, you do meet, obviously, other medical teams from other nations. Uh, you meet them when you go on tour. So you do make some good friendships. Uh, and rugby being rugby, it's a very social game. And, you know, um, there aren't many... Um, that they're all generally nice people that you're working with. And I've throughout the squads I've looked after, and I think it doesn't matter which country you go to, really. I think generally rugby people are good people, which makes my job a lot easier. Um, I've not worked much in football. As I say, I didn't have much chance at Cardiff City, um, my, my boyhood football club. But I think I would have struggled to, to work in football for any length of time. Um, and I watch, you know, watch some of the, Premiership sides on TV, and you know, it just I just couldn't cope with that really. Um, I I just know that if one of the rugby boys go down, there's usually something significant. Whereas I don't think you can always say that in in uh, professional the higher le- higher levels of professional football. Um, so yeah, and I've been very lucky with the WIU working with some very sort of great people in terms of medical department. Um, Mark Carcass Davis was a physiotherapist who. Played for Wales as well, um, capped several times for Wales in the back row. Um, but he worked for the WIU for over 30 years and uh, he left uh, probably a year or two ago. But I had so many great times working with him and learned so much from him because he, he was one of these guys blessed with very good rugby knowledge um, and very good medical physio knowledge as well, really. So he was invaluable in sort of offloading a lot of skills to myself. Um, I'm very lucky now to work with three physios i know you've interviewed a couple of them on your podcast but prab mathema john miles and more recently ben sterling and they're all so, so talented in their own rights obviously two of them have worked a lot in rugby league so they bring a, a 
a skill set that is slightly different to the conventional rugby union. But as a medical team, along with um, our soft tissue therapists, um, we seem to get on very well. We have we work very hard, but we have a, a good social time as well. And we all get on very well. So for me, that's probably one of the things that has aided my longevity in the role is the fact that I enjoy it. I enjoy working with the people who are there um, and we get on very, very well. Um, and that's, you know, it's nice. To, I think, you know, going to doing a job where you enjoy it, you know, to a certain extent isn't the proper job. You know, it's not like going into general practice and doing clinics and doing your own on call, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, was pretty hard when um, my, in my first sort of 16 years, because we were doing our own on call then Saturday mornings uh, and then working the following day. So it's pretty tough, really. So uh, I was quite keen to get out of that. But by the time I left, they'd, they'd sort of um, they'd had a sort of a separate system for out of hours, really. So my timing in that respect wasn't brilliant because uh, I was keen to get away from the out of hours side of things. But you know, I'm more than happy with the, the rugby and obviously very lucky to do the the Lions in South Africa. Um, you know, that obviously been my ultimate aspiration, really. Um, but I'd never really mentioned it because I didn't think it would happen. Um, but the only tainted bit about that, apart from the fact we lost the series that we probably should have won, having won the first test, um, was the fact it was in COVID and it was it was a it was a hollow tour basically. Um, and Prav has done a few Lions tours, Carcass has done a few Lions tours, and they tell me how good it is when the four nations come together and the the, the amount of support that is there. Um, and uh, we, we didn't get that. Um, and the tour was almost cancelled sort of midway through. We were stuck. It was, it was quite it was ironic, really. We were stuck in a fantastic hotel, the Arabella, about an hour outside Cape Town with a lovely golf course on the water. And it was beautiful. But by the end of the sixth week there, not being allowed to go out, you know, you were tearing your hair out. So it was such a glamorous setting. But we just couldn't go out. You know, we just couldn't socialize. You could, could play golf, go out in the grounds. But normally with a tour, the beauty is going to different places, meeting different people, going to nice restaurants, drinking nice wine. We still drank some nice wine, I have to say, but we couldn't go out and sample the delights, really. And um, so, you know, I certainly have my fingers crossed for Australia in next year. I mean, Wales are touring Australia this year, actually, in uh, July. So we've got a couple of tests in Australia, and that's the one country I haven't been to with the rugby. Because um, as I say, when I started in 2012, John Williams quite rightly uh, pulled rank and uh, did the uh, Australia tour. Then, um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to Australia because it's one place I haven't sort of toured really. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Oh no, no, all all does sound amazing. And that just, what's it like in the dressing room once you've had like that that England match that you mentioned? What what's it like when you you've won a game like that? It's I, I I forgot a uh, video on my phone of the, of, the, of the song we were singing and not you know one of our songs not you know, not a um, a song derogatory to anybody but just 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 seeing the 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 happiness and the excitement on it is amazing and you know I, I still look at that video from time to time because um, it just makes you realise how good things can be but clearly the converse of that is I've been in many changing rooms where that similar sort of noise is coming from the opponent's dressing room and you're there almost in tears silence you know um so it's very much an up and down feeling but what but when you have days like that life doesn't get any better um you know we've we've uh with, with, with wales and the world cups we've we've got to a semi-final and then lost the third fourth playoff and we've been to two quarterfinals but as i mentioned before with that england game in 2015 the margins are so small, you know, we played South Africa in the, the semi-final in 2000 and, or previously and, you know, we were leading until five, six, seven minutes to go. And, um, yeah, it's incredible, you know, the, the, the margins between win and losing at this top level can be tiny and it just does go on a bounce of the ball, a referee's decision, a TMO's decision. There are so many variables in the game now and I think it's important that consistency is is brought in wherever possible um and you know i think obviously looking to reduce injuries etc cetera, etc cetera, is really really important and i think we're doing quite a lot along those lines but rugby is a contact sport you know i think we've got to be prepared for for injury um 
but it's making sure that everybody who is pitch side is able to provide the level of expertise that these players deserve, particularly when they suffer a significant injury. And I've just come back from Twickenham with Andy Smith doing my missionary work, um, teaching on the Physis course, which is a pre-hospital immediate care and sport course, which everybody who works uh, professionally in rugby has to um, be assessed annually. Um, and that, from my point of view, is quite good teaching on that because it means you've got to brush up on your knowledge and your your practical skills and, you know, come at the right time because obviously Six Nations is about to start. So getting up to speed again and teaching people on this course and examining them just helps to reinforce your skill set and hopefully put you in a decent position for um, managing injuries appropriately as and when they come. And I can guarantee during these next five games, there will be some significant injuries and some significant challenges along the way mm. and, then, and then in terms of like the non-clinical skills that you think are needed to be successful what, what would you say they are i think the most important thing i think for any for anybody really but is is having good communication skills and i sort of mentioned about my general practice background and i certainly learned that um during that time um and obviously i, I was probably coming from a slightly different place in terms of just learning to speak was a was 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 progress, but but learning to be able to listen, to give the right sort of body language to people. Um, when you're breaking bad news, you know it's it's how you break bad news. There's there's ways of doing it, um, and certainly general practice helped me do that. So I think having good communication skills is a prerequisite for for working in team sport. Um, and obviously we're working in a multidisciplinary uh, environment with. Uh, strength and conditioning coaches, sports scientists, rugby coaches, and communication is key, really, when you've got a squad of 34. Everybody needs to be up to speed with what somebody can and cannot do in terms of their rugby and their rehabilitation. So I think the two things for me is good communication skills and being prepared to to work in a multi, uh, multi-sport environment, a, a, a multidisciplinary team, and not being afraid to take not so much criticism, but take on board what other people are saying as well. You know, so a lot of our decisions are not unilateral. They're they're multilateral. Um, and a lot of things where there's a little bit of controversy, then we'll we'll have discussions about it. And I think you've got to be prepared to to sort of um, listen to what other people say, really. And, uh, you know, I've realized that you know, I can add something to a group, but it's the, it's the sum of the parts that make us probably better than what the individuals are because certainly within the Welsh rugby we seem to work very well and uh, during my 12 years there's been um, there's not been a massive turnover of staff so a significant number of the staff were there when I was there 12 years ago um, there has been some turnover people get promotions etc cetera, etc cetera, so that the group is freshened up from time to time but you know I think the ethos is still the same that we we you know we work very hard um, we get on very well with each other and we have a bit of fun as well um, so that we do enjoy getting together so we're getting together next week and I'm sure everybody's now looking forward to it I've done very little for the last two months so I'm looking forward to getting a little bit of discipline back into my life for for the next eight to ten weeks and I can go back on holiday again then so what do you do like in between then camps at international level what are you actually doing then well since the world cup very little I, I sort of a bit embarrassed to say um but I'm at the other end of my career is really. I don't need to chase anything I don't need to chase money I don't need to chase prestige or status um but you know I had previously been doing some private clinics obviously Cardiff Spire I've done a lot there and worked with some very good orthopedic surgeons Nuffield in Cardiff um who still do our MRI scans for the WRU I worked there for about nine or ten years um and Buper in Bristol, but I've slowly sort of reduced those roles and essentially I don't do very much in between times. Um, although I still do a quite a lot for the faculty in uh, Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine in Edinburgh. Um, I was an elected council member for three years, having just come off the council, uh, been examining there for the last 15 years for the OSCE component of the exam, which is usually held every April. I've just been involved with setting up a new diploma in team sport, um, which has been quite challenging, but there's been a fairly big group of us and we've just we've put the curriculum together and now we're in the process of setting questions now. 
uh, for for the exam, which I think is going to be in the summertime. Um, this is just the FSEM trying to sort of diversify a little bit away from pure sports medicine. They've got a diploma in musculoskeletal medicine. Um, obviously, the team sport one is going to come online. So there's a lot that goes on in the background, and I've done a fair bit with Bath University over the years with examining and teaching and previously in Cardiff University in their sports medicine diploma, which is currently has been suspended or just doesn't happen anymore. So there was a lot of roles I was doing, um, but I'm pretty pretty content really to to crack on with the rugby and uh, enjoy a little bit of the downtime that I think I've probably earned over the years. My wife may not agree and my kids probably wouldn't agree, but I agree. <laughs> That, that, yeah, that's the main thing. And then, so you yeah. can see the the Bale shirt behind you. Yeah, Gareth Bale. Yeah, it does. There's nothing wrong with your eyesight, is there? Well, no, I can see um, the Man U one. I want to see what the is that Dan James? Was that Dan James one in the background know, over the other shoulder? Let's have a look. That's that. Uh, that's the gap, though. They're they're all rugby. This is this is the British Lions one over. Okay, right. They're they're Welsh jerseys from the Grand Slams, and that's from the the. Uh, British Lions tour there. Um, no, the, the Gareth Bell one is um, my, my, my brother's a family friend of his father, and the, I used to play rugby with his father, Frank. Um, we were a fundraiser at Witcher's Rugby Club and uh, raising money for the British Heart Foundation. And um, I knew that his shirt was coming up because his parents had obviously donated it. Um, so I put myself this upper limit on what I would bid on it. Uh, my wife was a little bit annoyed, really, but I paid a little bit more than I was planning to. But for me, it's quite a special jersey because it was last year in Real Madrid. Um, it was Real Madrid. He was that, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was quite special. And obviously, having known his dad, I know his dad and his mum. Um, so it's just quite nice to get that there. And then one of the other ones up there, uh, Cardiff Blues won the Amlin Cup against um, Toulon in uh, Marseille in 2009 or 10. That was quite special. And then um, there's a New Zealand uh, under 20s World Cup jersey in the back there, which you can't quite see. But I was the um, I was the medical lead for the for the under 20s World Cup in Cardiff. Uh, again, that was probably about 12 years ago. But quite a lot of those All Blacks on there are actually current All Blacks. Um, so they obviously do come through the system, as happens in probably most of the other international rugby sides, really. Um, so. All my jerseys have to come up here generally because um, my wife doesn't like them around the house, probably quite rightly. Because and then Dennis Paris Rugby Club, which is 30 yards that way, they've got about six of my jerseys in there as well because you, know, you just get too many over the years, really. But I think I, I I always like to get a jersey signed if it's if it's a big moment, so a Grand Slam or you know, one that you're going to remember. But obviously there are a lot of seasons where you go through it, you do your job, and you don't get any sort of trappings of success and that's why I think you've just got to take take the rough with the smooth, really. You know, there there, there are good times, but there'll always be bad times uh, mm. or times where you're not so successful. Um, and I think, you know, Welsh rugby fans probably realise that. We've been pretty blessed in the last 10 or 15 years for such a, you know, a small rugby playing nation, really. Um, just a concern of, for me is that obviously retaining our players, really. And I think England have that to a certain extent, particularly with players going to France and to Japan. Um, so it's a big issue, I think, for, for rugby union at the moment, particularly for the small nations who we've got a very small playing pool, really. We can't afford for people to to sort of go off to other countries. But again, that's for the uh, the administrators to sort out rather than myself, I guess. Mm. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you sharing your insight and some of the stories. So, you know, it's in a, an amazing career and hopefully you get to, to sample a proper Lions tour. Yeah, that's the hope anyway. So uh, keep my fingers crossed and uh, see what comes of that, really. Brilliant. Jeff, really appreciate your time. Um, thanks, for, thanks for being so open. My pleasure. Very nice to meet you. Cheers. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.